Hello and welcome to IB Times TV. I'm Liana Brinder, Business Editor for the International Business Times. Joining me now is Ken Alyssa, he's the Chairman of Restoration Partners. Hello, so, hi. Liana, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. good. So, lovely sunny day and... Yes, uh, again, yep. And so, how about a sunny lo outlook for the you know, British economy? We're looking at um, tech companies that yep. meant to really promote um, strong economic growth for the UK. So, maybe you can tell us a bit about the landscape. Well, I'll quickly break it down. There are a couple of hundred very big tech companies. And I, when I talk about tech, of course, I mean IT, computing, the cloud network, and so on. There are then about 300,000, 350,000 SMEs and about 400,000 startups in the tech space. So overall, tech is about a million enterprises in the UK. And the great thing about tech, of course, is this is one of those exciting periods that we have on the, on the cycle. And we're approaching a peak again, I think, because the combination of the cloud, of, of cyber security and all the issues around that, which of course are terrible on the negative, but they're rather good for business because you've got to invent solutions to the, to the threats and so on. Plus you've got the ubiquity of computers, RFID tags, QR codes, mobile phones, blah, 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 billions of machines across the planet. The ability to use platforms like Facebook and so on to sell to anybody in the world We've never had it so good from an IT industry perspective. And with a million enterprises in the UK all beavering away trying to find the next holy grail, this is a pretty good time to be an entrepreneur in tech. Well, with that will naturally um, come challenges. And with how the bank uh, financing situation has been over the last yes. few years, it's been pretty tight. So what kind of ways have um, tech companies from micro startups mm -hmm. yep. to SMEs look for alternative ways of financing? Well, you're quite right. You've just pricked my bubble there. <laughs> so there, there is one big problem, which is debt financing for, for smallish companies. But I'll come back to that in a second. There's a lot of capital about. We've got a rather good tax regime in the UK now, with EIS in particular, and SEIS for the very early stage companies. And that means if you're a personal investor, it's, it, I would argue anyway, obviously I would, but I would argue it's more in your interest to put money through the EIS scheme into an early stage company where you've got a connection, where you know the founders, there's a bond of trust and you've got some confidence in them than to bung it in an ISA or into an equity market stock at the moment. So the tax regime is really rather beneficial and we've never had that before. So that's another rather positive point in the UK. AIM is, uh, is beginning to move again. I'm proud to say I'm chairman of Outsourcery. We just floated a couple of weeks ago on AIM. We've got a very good valuation. We raised about £11 million net, supported by Investec. Biggest IPO, tech IPO in the UK. There are others now coming to the market. So the, the equity market is at least showing signs of life. I don't want to overstate that, but it's showing signs of life. That must continue. But your bubble bursting point from earlier on is about debt financing, particularly from the banks. The most irritating thing is we, the taxpayer, have put billions into the funding for lending scheme into the banks and almost none of it has got into SMEs and of the little bit that has got to SMEs, I think none of it has gone to tech companies. And the reason is, of course, tech companies can't provide security. There's no printing machine, there's no fleet of trucks, there's no sandwich making, bread cutting technology or whatever. There's just some clever people writing code and doing something on the internet. Banks don't get that, they say we can't understand the risk, therefore we won't lend you any money. Or if we will lend you some money, you must pledge your home as security. Now anybody who's been an entrepreneur knows that the last thing you're going to do is go home to your husband or wife and say, I'm really sorry darling, but uh, you know that really wizzo idea I had, it didn't quite work and we've now lost our house. It's, it's antithetical to the, the spirit of enterprise. So guess what? Nobody comes to the banks to ask for any money because those who've gone already have told everybody else it's a waste of time. The banks, on the other hand, say there's no demand. Nonsense. There's tons of demand pent up, but it's not wasting its time. It's got, it's got entrepreneurial businesses to run to go not waste its time going to banks. There's another myth, though, in all of this, which is people say, oh, yeah, but early stage companies, SMEs, they're risky, and therefore they should only get equity finance and they shouldn't get debt. That's also nonsense. It's clearly nonsense. I mean, first of all, every bank on the planet just about went belly up in 2008, and they were big established organizations. So the risk profile of the industry isn't to do with size, it's to do with the quality of management and the risk assessment. The second reason that it's complete nonsense is there are periods of time in a company's growth when you need debt. For example, you're raising a million pounds in equity. All the people are putting money in are saying, well, we won't give you our money until you know, we know you've got the rest of it. So it goes into escrow. While that's happening, you've got a period of time when you've got to bridge between where you were and where you're going. That's a classic application of debt. Can't get it from the banks. So yeah, the big hole in the, in the, in the story at the moment is, on, is only debt. So 
entrepreneurs are finding other ways, crowdfunding on the web, borrowing from friends, using their credit cards again, a million other non-proper, non-institutional ways. Sure, and maybe you can expand on that because um, with tech companies, the whole point of them is that they're creative and innovative. Yep. So when they come across hurdles like that for their debt uh, financing that or refinancing, they um, have sought out ways like crowdfunding or going th through maybe yep. non-traditional ways of getting that capital. Can you talk about maybe some of those options that are open to... Yep. Well, there are several crowdfunding sites, and I know on tech entrepreneurs who've gone to them and raised modest amounts of money, half a million. Sometimes it's equity, sometimes it's debt. Interestingly, though, some of the crowdfunding sites, the debt-providing ones, are looking for security as if they were a bank. So they're blown out. They're great for the sandwich maker with the machine. They're no good at all for the, for the, the high-growth potential tech company. By the way, I don't want to be rude about sandwich makers. I approve of those. It's just that they're not going to explode the economy in the way that the tech sector can. So crowdfunding is absolutely one. Forming syndicates, there are lots of angel groups forming now for men and women who've got a little bit of wealth and they're prepared to lend and or to invest. So what we're seeing is a non-institutional sector emerging, which is a threat for the institutions. And so they, they're going to have to get their act together before they find they've been replaced by some modern online engine created by people who didn't care about what they did in 1897. Well, in terms of what the government's doing, I mean, as a veteran in the tech sector, you've obviously been working and talking with the government and some of the departments in um, maybe some initiatives um, to, you know, help the industry yeah. out. Can you walk through some of those initiatives? Well, well, talking to the government is quite a hard thing to do, so I wouldn't want to overblow what we've been able to do. We are in what I jokingly call asynchronous dialogue, which is I write to the government with a jolly good idea, nothing happens, my secretary chases them up, we eventually get a confirmation back, they've got the letter, then we eventually get a proper answer, and then we have another discussion. So I can't say we're moving at the speed of light in this, at this point, but our argument from Restoration Partners is quite simple. If you want to borrow money and the lender wants security, that's an insurance problem, not a security problem. So don't ask someone to put their house on the line, ask them to take out an insurance policy that says they will, they're good for the repayment. And we do that with mortgages for domestic markets. So it's not a, we have, we're not inventing the wheel here, it's just not done in SME lending. And we've invented something called the GRIP, which is the Guaranteed Repayment Insurance Premium. Get a GRIP is the, is the t-shirt slogan of the idea. And the idea is that you borrow a million pounds from a lender, 15 a percent of that, 150,000, goes in as a premium into a pot which then underwrites everybody else's loans. We've calculated that you can lose half the loan book just about on a straight line basis over four years and still make a profit as the insurer. Meanwhile, the entrepreneurs have got their 850,000 net to invest or to use. We've tested that with our entrepreneurial clients who have said bring it on, so that wasn't really very difficult. We've talked to the government in my asynchronous way and we'll see what happens now before the, the summer recess. And we don't really need the government to do anything with it, except in the so-called uh, loan guarantee scheme that the government runs with banks, they guarantee 15% of the overall bank's portfolio and into Alia 75% of any particular loan. And we're saying, well, why don't you put your 15% into this same pot? So 15% premium, 15% government guarantee. You've now got a 30% pot to underwrite those loans. You can go much bigger, take more risk and have less losses. So that's the nature of the debate. We'll, uh, I wouldn't hold your breath to hear the answer, but we won't give up until we've got a proper response. Well, you're clearly you know, one of the key supporters in the UK of um, helping these companies out. But maybe to round off, we can talk about you know, our future generation of tech companies and individuals. And um, recently, um, I know that you've been involved in helping some uh, donations in terms of um, education to mm -hmm. try and get yeah. more people into tech. So maybe you can talk about how important it is at, and at what level you need to really, um, I suppose, inspire people to get into the industry. Well, there, there's a brilliant change in the UK that's happened only very recently. For those of you of your generation and even younger, you'll know that when you went to school and you studied IT, you were taught how to use the Microsoft Office Suite. Yeah. Now, that's quite an important skill, but it's like being taught how to use a hammer or a screwdriver. It doesn't tell you how to make a hammer or a screwdriver, or indeed make anything else with the hammer or the screwdriver. And I'm uh, a vice president of the, of the British Computer Society, the BCS, and we've been lobbying long and hard with the Department for Education to have a proper curri uh, curriculum, computer science curriculum. And Michael Gove announced this week that as of the new curriculum, people will learn how to program computers as well as to do PowerPoint and Word. You need to do both. That will inspire, as I was inspired a million years ago, young people to create something 
technically using computers. And that, that's, we don't have that today. That's a, that's a fundamental change. So if we're doing quite well already, that's just going to be another fuel coming along behind. And then more gen generally, and I suspect this is what you're alluding to, my wife and I made a donation to my old college, Fitzwilliam at Cambridge, for the library and IT centre, which is a rather stonking building. I recommend you Google Olissa Library. I do probably about every hour on the hour. <laughs> And that's, that's wonderful. And, and what that's doing is that's reminding young people of two things. One is, yes, you should study, and there's a great venue 24-7 to go study. But the second is we're very lucky in this country about the, for the way that other people help each other, this whole concept of the crowdfunding, the networking, the support, and so on. And we've given back as a symbol to everybody else that they should also give back. And again, you see young people helping other young people, mentoring them as they build their businesses. So it doesn't matter how depressed I can get about bank lending. I think the future is bright. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. And that was Ken Alyssa, Chairman of Restoration Partners. Thank you.